May 22nd, 2023, Punta Gorda Planning Commission is called to order. Could we please get a roll call? Tim Sandage. Here. Robert Sifrit. Paul Sacolato. Here. Lisa Kelly Thorne. Here. Sherman Johnson. Here. Harvey Goldberg. Here. Brad Gamblin. Here. Joseph Como. Here. Okay, could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, the next meeting is June 26th of 2023. Um, if anybody has a reason that they're not going to be there, please let the city clerk's office. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there is a possibility that I may not be at that meeting, but I'll let the city clerk's office know in sufficient time. Oh, good. I already let her know. I'll talk to you after. Okay, because there's also a possibility I may not be there. If you're doing a head count, that's three. <laughs> Okay. Next is public comments. If there's anyone here wishing to address the Planning Commission on any subject, they may do so at the appropriate time during the meeting, which is now. For those who wish to choose to speak, must state their name and record, uh, state their name for the record. Each person will be allowed to speak for a maximum of three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Going twice. Three times, no one wishing to speak. Public comments are closed. Any motion for that? No, I don't show that nobody spoke. Okay, approval of minutes. Uh, we have the minutes of the February and March meetings uh, in our agenda. Does anybody have any comments or changes? I'll move approval of both the February uh, 27th and March 27th. Uh, Committee meetings. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the February and March minutes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We have no legislative public hearings. We have one quasi-judicial public hearing. And that is SRC 03-2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, approving the preliminary plat to subdivide a parcel of land containing 28.53 plus or minus acres into 144 single family residential lots and construct the required infrastructure, including but not limited to utility improvements and, a privately, and privately maintained roadways in order to create a subdivision to be called SECO subdivision, a tract or parcel of land situated in the state of Florida, County of Charlotte, lying in section 21 township 41 south range 23 east being a portion of the parcel as described in official records book 3642 page 473 charlotte county public records and being further bounded and described in exhibit a attached to this resolution and providing an effective date staff thank you Dwayne nodine urban design staff I celebrated my two-month anniversary on saturday with urban design Glad to be here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to try to run the technology here. Uh, anyway, this is a CCOPE subdivision, SRC 03-2022, preliminary plat review. Uh, I'm already going the wrong way. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. You might want to go ahead and do our swearing oh, in because it's quasi okay. just before he starts his testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, if anyone is going to get... Plans to give testimony or thinks they might give testimony in this quasi-judicial public hearing. Could they please stand and be sworn in? 
Anyone intending to offer testimony, please make sure you have your right hand raised. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? You. When you're ready to speak, please state your name at the podium. Thank you. You might need to crank your mic over towards you a little bit. There we go. Thank you. What am I doing wrong here, Mitchell? Don't use the mouse. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dwayne Nodine for the record with Staff Planner with Urban Design. Have been sworn. Uh, this is the preliminary plat before you today, the public hearing. Uh, just a quick over review here uh, for a subdivision plat project of this type is actually a four-step process. Uh, Pre-application pre meeting between Urban Design and uh, the developer, which has uh, occurred, I believe, probably many months ago. Uh, the uh, preliminary plat, which is today's review. And then uh, infrastructure plans have to also be reviewed and approved, and we're doing that concurrently. And then the fourth and final stage will be approval of the, uh, the final plat. And this also uh, goes from development review to plan commission to, to also to city council. So. Uh, this project is located on the immediate west side of Taylor Road, just north of no North Jones Loop Road on the, the far south side of the uh, city of Punta Gorda. It consists of just over 28 acres, proposing 144 lots that will be single family attached dwellings. Property line will go down the party wall between uh, the two units with a off side yard setback on the opposite side. Uh, this property was rezoned into a planned development neighborhood. Uh, district back in 2022. As part of the preliminary plat requirements, there's about a dozen or so different items in the uh, the ordinance, Chapter 20A, that we look at. Uh, you got a list of them there before you. Uh, there's also a property boundary survey that is submitted that has various information on it, not only the property boundary, but also some things uh, such as the, the land use or the property ownership around the parcel. Uh, the street access, the big things here will be uh, access from Taylor Road uh, on the northeast side of the, uh, the boundary there, that short leg and towards the upper right-hand corner of the, the drawing. And then also down in the lower left-hand corner, uh, an access to Jones Loop Road. The streets will be privately built and maintained. Uh, the street right-of-way width is 45 feet right-of-way with 10-foot ut public utility easement on each side of the, uh, the actual road right-of-way itself, give you, giving you an actual... Uh, 65 feet effective width for, uh, for utilities. Uh, street names have been uh, reviewed and approved by the fire marshal and the zoning official. If there's someone who can mess up the technology, it's me. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. <coughs> so, a little bit more here on the ongoing, on the, uh, the, the dozen or so requirements for the, uh, the preliminary plat, which uh, on the right there is, the, uh, uh, is actually uh, what's going to be the first page of the actual uh, final plat. Uh, look at things like the utility and drainage easements, other, other sites that will be not actually residential. There is going to be uh, a swimming pool and, an, and a recreation facility, uh, clubhouse that goes with this facility that's up at the north end of the site. Uh, as I said before, 144 lots. Typical lot size is just over 35 feet by 115 feet long. What am I doing wrong, Mitchell? Oh, I am sorry. And then we also are looking at the, uh, the infrastructure improvements concurrently. Uh, went through the development review committee a few weeks ago. And then also uh, have, we have a draft of the, the uh, restrictive or protective covenants. So basically overall here our findings and summary is uh, the, the preliminary plat is found, has been found to be in compliance with our subdivision control ordinance which is chapter 20A in the city's uh, book of ordinances. 140, again, 144 single family attached buildable lots. 
and we have been looking at, have looked at the, uh, the infrastructure uh, plans, which includes municipal water, uh, sanitary sewer, uh, which will be uh, operated by and supplied by City of Punta Gorda. There's also a stormwater management system that has a, uh, a stormwater basin in the middle of the, uh, the complex and uh, privately owned and maintained uh, stormwater piping and structures uh, scattered throughout the, uh, the development at the appropriate places. Uh, was, was rezoned from highway commercial to planned development uh, earlier. And uh, also here, next page here, we're gonna take a look just at a couple things on uh, meeting the requirements of the comprehensive plan here uh, shortly. Uh, so nothing more to really talk about there. I've already hit all that. Uh, was rezoned, lot size is acceptable again, 30, just over 35 feet by 115 feet deep. And we and looking at uh, consi con compliance consistency with the comprehensive plan, uh, look at uh, various policies and objectives for future land use, recreation, open space, uh, public schools element, intergovernmental inter coordination. As I said earlier, also, but just to summarize, uh, we're in the, in the second step of the overall process. Uh, went through development review committee, at planning commission today, we'll go to city council next, and then, then also we'll do final plat. Just to repeat there on infrastructure plans have, are being, have been reviewed. Uh, urban, divine, urban design staff does recommend a preliminary plot approval subject conditions outlined in the staff report, which I need to note that the staff uh, report has been read into the record by reference today. That's it for me. Have any questions for staff? Does anyone have any questions for the staff? Yes. Um, <clears throat> we the requirement is for 50 feet on the width of the streets. Uh, the applicant is proposing 45 feet. Um, we've decided that that's acceptable. Why? Uh, so the, the applicant has provided a uh, preliminary plat which has the rights of way for the roadway platted at 45 feet and then in addition to that on each side, which is the lots, uh, there's a 10 foot uh, utility easement. So the effective, useful uh, right of way for the roadway, the travel way and the uh, utilities is 65 feet. So that's... Okay. But Why it was <clears> like what about bicycles and things like that? I mean, with the short, narrower, the actual roads going to be narrower. Uh, so the actual carriageway for the vehicles would still need to comply with the the standards of the city. So 24 foot um, is is standard for the actual street, the pavement width. Okay. And the next question is: uh, <clears throat> There's a requirement that. If the block length is 500 feet, there has to be some passageway somewhere in that block. Uh, the applicant says that they consider this to be voluntary. Is it really voluntary? Uh, so the way the code's written, no, is not voluntary, but the, the subject property uh, has gone through the plan development process. So the plan development conceptual site plan uh, is the same as the proposed um, plat. Uh, plat, so, so that is so the so LDR that conformance is is superseded by that um, so by yeah. the LDR. So what you're telling me is the plan development supersedes the LDR. It, the plan development supersedes the 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 500 foot block length. Now, why did we have that requirement for that? passageway in a 500 foot block was that for the fire department uh, no it's it's uh, it's for walkability it's oh. to ensure that that blocks aren't too big and that you have a, a a connection so it's the same reason that the the uh, cul-de-sac links are uh, mm. restricted to 250 feet is to encourage 
more connected street network, which does two things. A, it makes it more walkable, but B, it also increases your, um, your utility connections and your public safety access. But given the configuration and size of this site, uh, the stormwater management, uh, the configuration is, is uh, acceptable from that standpoint. There are two entrances and exits, so. Can we tell whether this is gonna have sidewalks? Uh, I believe in the, so this is just the preliminary plat review, but in the infrastructure, which is running concurrently, there is sidewalk proposed through the facility. Okay, uh, my other streets. question was, this is part of that community development district I think it's included in that community development district that was approved by the planning commission several weeks ago or several correct. months ago. Isn't that correct? Correct. So I know I didn't notice that the staff mentioned that in its presentation that this has already been kind of through the mill with regard to that community development district approval. Uh, correct. The, the community development district is a funding mechanism that is separate from the actual land development regulation and subdivision regulation application. Uh, the city council did, uh, um, they didn't recommend approval, they basically uh, recommended the CDD for the, next, the second public hearing. They did have some questions on it. So that is still um, up in the air as far as the policy decision on whether or not the CDD, the Community Development District, will be approved. Okay, got you. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. On the re retention pond, the stormwater retention pond, does that have an overflow? Uh, so the technical engineering details are probably best addressed by the uh, applicant's representative who's here if you want to let them give their presentation or answer any questions that would probably be best. Did you still have a question? <clears throat> Any other staff? Applicant? Good afternoon. For the record, Todd Rebel uh, here on behalf of the applicant with Banks Engineering. I'm sorry. I uh, haven't sworn. We have received the staff report from the city staff. We share in their findings. Um, and I'm certainly here to answer any of your questions. So I can answer the stormwater question. Yes, there is a control structure that's a part of that stormwater facility, which is also shown on the infrastructure plans that uh, Mitchell had mentioned. Um, that is set at a top elevation for the 25 year storm, and it can handle a 100 year discharge above and beyond that, as per state requires. Anyone else? I have what might be, just, oh, go ahead, Mr. Goldberg. Thank you. I'm uh, just a uh, curious question. Are these rental units or for sale units? Uh, I, I can't answer that. I mean, they're, they are, it, it, my understanding is they're for sale units. Okay. Correct. Thank yeah. And they're, and they're also proposed to be single family attached villas uh, that was allowed as part of the plan development neighborhood rezoning. Um, so that's why they're, they're, they'll be sharing a wall, uh, zero lot line. Just as a reminder, the City of Punta Gorda uh, uh, Code of Ordinances is agnostic as to ownership type, rental or for sale. So just a okay. point of clarification. Okay. And, and this is probably just an administrative or editorial thing, but on um, page 13 of the agenda under summary, it says uh, subdivide the parcel of land into 14 city family or single family lots which differs from the 144, and then on the first page of the affidavit public, uh, no, affidavit of posting notice, it says uh, in the 146 um, single family residential. I think the consensus is 144, but those are just a couple of editorial things that I don't know if they need to be corrected or not. Yeah, the 146 was the maximum per the zoning, and we're proposing 144. I think that was just a Scribner's error on the summary. But the, uh, the, uh, the actual write-up of the SRC-03 yeah. had it correct at 144. Yeah, I just thought I'd say, I went through it, I saw a couple there and figured 144 was it. Right. Okay. Does anyone have anything else? The applicant? Okay, thank you. Thank you. A 
motion to close the public hearing? I don't think what, hang on. We didn't open the public hearing. Oh, we didn't open the public <laughs> hearing. Never mind. Okay, now we can open the public hearing. Okay. <coughs> a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Do we need one? We don't need one. No, we All right, we'll open the public hearing. Are there any comments? Once, twice, three times. No. Move to close Move. the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Public hearing is closed unanimously. Okay. Anyone have anything else? Hmm. Can we get a, um, a motion? Okay, so the public hearing is closed. I'll make the motion. Based on the evidence and testimony. Okay. Testimony presented at this public hearing for item SRC 03-2022. Sorry. Uh, that we recommend that this, uh, I find that this request is consistent with the city of Punagota comprehensive plan. I don't know what I'm reading here. And, and include the terms and conditions recommended by staff. If any person, oh, no. just public hearing. Okay. And it's consistent just with Punagorda Pun comprehensive plan and move approval with the conditions. Okay. Person decides that we recommend the city council approval with conditions uh, of this request by the uh, planning commission or the planning department. Second the motion. All in favor? <laughs> uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Good work. It is, it is a tedious one. Okay. Moving on. That ends the, all of the um, Quasi judicial. Now we go into general business. Board of, Board of Zoning Appeals duties. So at the March 1st, 2023 City Council meeting, Council approved proceeding with transferring the Board of Zoning Appeals duties to the Planning Commission. A draft of the bylaws, including language to accomplish the transfer of the Board of Zoning Appeals duties, was included in the agenda packet. Uh, at this point, all we want to know is if that language is acceptable to the commission. We will not be moving forward with making that change until it's closer to the time the land de development regulations will be approved so that we can tie that change into the other ordinance changes for Chapter 26. Mr. Chair, comments? Yep. On um, of the draft, uh, Grant proposal um, refer to page seven, at the bottom uh, where it uh, discusses uh, addresses conflict conflict of interest. Um, I recommend that the, the consideration to also put the paragraph in related to bias that is uh, in the bylaws of the planning commission, uh, section five point three. So you're, you're referring to the um, Board of Zoning Appeals. As I understand it, these are sort of the existing terms of reference or the bylaws for the two separate committees. Is that, tr is that the way I'm reading this? Uh, could you repeat that? Okay, so the first one we have here, the draft, is City of Punta Gorda, Florida Planning and Zoning Commission bylaws. Uh, and then the second part of that, starting on page 83, it says, um, City of Punta Gorda, Florida Board of Zoning Appeals. So what, what the first section here would be the proposed bylaws of the joint? Correct. Correct. Yes. And the other would be the, is, is the existing, so what is in the second part of this would essentially be null and void after the two committees are joined together. together. Correct. Okay. So I think it would be taken care of because it's included in the first section uh, 
under uh, Section 5.3. In that case, it would be. There's a great deal more of specificity. I understand that. Thank you for that clarification. There's a great deal more specificity uh, in the Board of Zoning Appeals bylaws than in the combined yes. bylaws document. Yes. Um, Much of that is uh, repeated language from the Chapter 26 Code yes. of Ordinances as it exists yeah, currently. Exactly. Um, okay. I'd like to make a comment. Oh, hang on. Are you, are we getting anything else? Well, you know, I was referring to, uh, um, such as on pages 85, 86, and 87 of our documents, uh, the uh, considerations for, for appeals, the um, limitations to uh, power variances, and um, again, those, uh, those items again on page 87 are significant. Are you saying, sir, then that those are incorporated into the documentation for the combined organization or committee? Could you give me one moment to try to navigate to the part you're looking at? I'm sorry. Uh, it, it looks like those are out of the ordinance and not part of the combined. The combined um, uh, bylaws are pages uh, 78, 79, 80, 81, and 82. Uh, the, the pages you're talking about are extracted, I believe, straight from ordinance, city ordinance, uh, and, and, and were not part of um, the new bylaws. That would be, if you would, an addendum uh, to the bylaws if you wanted it in terms of, of procedure and that sort of thing, but not part of the bylaws of the committee okay, or I commission. Didn't... There was a lot of information that was included in the Board of Zoning Appeals bylaws as they currently exist that we felt didn't necessarily need to be included within the bylaws, particularly the portion that referred to um, how the zoning official handles things outside of meetings. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, I've, I've sat on the code of uh, the Board of Appeals and I can tell you that the requirements on page 87, which are very specific, items one through eight, were emblazoned into our foreheads. And you had to check off every one of those before you could grant a variance. It was mandatory. And it was provided to each board member to put in front of him before we acted on any variance. So I cannot see why a combined, how a combined um, set of bylaws would not at the minimum include these eight specific requirements for approval of variances, which everybody on the Code of Board, Board of Zoning Appeals had to follow. I mean, it's very, very specific. They would still be required to uh, meet, make sure that any application that they are approving or uh, recommending not be approved meets those criteria because it's part of the code, not because it's part of the bylaws. Well, the I understand, code but, that. but the, unless the board has the code sitting in front of it continuously, it's basically procedural so for the Board of Zoning Appeals. Even though it's in code, it is procedural. This and is true. Um, with the bylaws, the bylaws are not typically directly in front of members during meetings either. The approval criteria are going to be provided within the uh, notebook that we'll be beginning to distribute at meetings. Okay. Bylaws aren't the, uh, the code. The bylaws is how things kind of function. And it's essentially the same way right now for the Planning Commission. All of the criteria that they gave us in terms of plan approval criteria, all of these other sorts of things that we have, you know, special exceptions, all of these are criteria that we use. And each time you, there's a, a request, you have to ensure that it meets those criteria. These eight things were essentially the same thing. I see it, uh, like I said, an addendum. I agree with the, with the importance of it. You absolutely have to, just like we do now, or are supposed to do now with the Planning Commission. If it meets these criteria, and only if it meets these criteria, do we approve it? But I don't see it as part of the function 
of bylaws. Bylaws are a, a, an overview, a guidance document for how something operates, not the individual criteria for making a functional or operational decision uh, in terms of, of what you're doing, you know. It, it's not uh, a measure of evaluating the quality or, or whatever of a proposal. Well, it is, as a matter of fact, the means by which you evaluate a proposal. It has to meet all these criteria. True. Yeah. I, it I is just, a means. Just like the criteria we have in the book. For, yeah, yeah. For, I've got for our pages and pages of this right here for what we have to do in the planning commission. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So what you're saying is um, that, that um, uh, for example, the limitations on the powers to grant variances and uh, these eight items that uh, were, were mentioned and uh, particular information about special exceptions, that'll be in that documentation that we'll put in this binder. If they're not in the, I don't, I didn't see them in chapter 26 of the code. So this comes back to the, the clerk's office and um, code enforcement, urban planning. Urban. If you want, we can have a more in-depth discussion next time after you've voiced all your concerns. I am fairly certain those sections were scattered throughout Chapter 26, something I found while I was uh, reviewing the Board of Zoning Appeals bylaws is that much of what they contain is scattered throughout Chapter 26. It's not all consolidated in one specific area. I believe it was uh, uh, Urban Design who gave us these laminated copies. It says PD plan approval criteria and there's nine things there. Comprehensive plan, future land use map amendment, and it's got, you know, six criteria. Now, all of these criteria for approval, and these eight things are criteria for approval of a proposal, and as such, it is, yes, we absolutely should have it, and it should be part of consideration of anything that comes before the board, but, um, you know, it, it's like trying to keep the, the bylaw is a, a relatively brief overview document and all of the technical uh, issues supporting it would be supporting documentation. Well, I must say I don't agree. I think in this particular case where these specific criteria are spread throughout chapter 26 and not collated in one convenient list should be in the bylaws for the Board and of Zoning Appeals. Also to the point that they're somewhat scattered right now, that is also part of why we want to wait until we're getting closer to the revisions to Chapter 26 being made so that we can make sure everything is organized well Good. and consolidated. Okay, that makes sense. I don't, I don't think um, you know, all this, I mean, it's pretty uh, um, expansive and probably does not fit into the, into the bylaws but it needs to be enumerated someplace in a very consolidated and concise manner so that it can be re referenced and not have to go through multiple pages or, or sections um, of, the, of section 26 to find it specifically. And, and as, uh, as planning now does, or as the, uh, the office now does, when they come forward with a proposal, as part of their summary, they say, and it meets this criteria, and it meets this criteria, and it meets this criteria, and they show each paragraph and subset of, of the comprehensive plan and everything else that it meets. This can be exactly the same way. If there's an issue to be considered where those eight criteria are pertinent, then as part of that, you say, whoever's presenting it, it meets this criteria, it meets this criteria, or whatever. And if it doesn't meet the eight criteria, Okay, it's out of there, but they need to demonstrate that it meets the eight criteria as part of the presentation. Is that would that be acceptable? Uh, and I don't know who's going to support. Well, it'll be the same office is going to end up supporting this, I suppose. I mean, between between uh, uh, planning and and uh, the city cl city clerk. Does that seem so? Urban design. 
yeah. is is leading the rewrite of section 26. Yes. And so this will be feedback for their per for the use. Uh, yes. So, uh, for the record, Mitchell Austin Urban Design. Uh, <coughs> Or the urban design department is uh, leading the effort for the land development regulation rewrite. Uh, the criteria and duties and responsibilities of the boards are generally held within uh, articles, I believe it's 15 and 16. I was trying to look that up real quick. Um, and those sections need to be aligned with the bylaws. So that's where we get the, the clarity that the bylaws are referencing those areas and they point directly to those criteria that need to be evaluated depending on the application. So one, one of those articles is about the committees and one of them is about the actual applications. So that is where we, we need to point people to um, in, from my perspective. So going forward, we can make it a, a I, I don't know, you can't call it a condition or whatever since this is just for discussion, but that um, uh, a process be established to ensure that these eight criteria are part of the presentation, approval, whatever, similar to what we already have for, you know, planning commission. And at the, uh, I'm sure Paul can tell you that at the Board of Zoning Appeals meetings, when Lisa gives her presentations, she does always go through, just like she has here, and ensure that everyone understands that the application meets each and every criteria, or in some occasions, does not. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've got, I've got, and I've already read, I've got right here, and I've read, previously read, um, uh, sections 15 and 16 from uh, uh, chapter 26 of the code. And there's nothing in there that reflects at this time uh, those matters that we are, are concerned about. So it would be appropriate place for that, and it can be easily overlaid uh, or inserted. Um, and, but it, it has to happen that way. Thank you. Anyone? Anything else? On this. Okay. Well, we need to uh, close it then since these are all for discussion. Um, and this will come back again later on as we get closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, just probably a special point of emphasis <coughs> on those trying to combine the, the procedures of the two committees to ensure that, you know, all the appropriate checklists are met. Is there an estimation, possibly Mitchell can answer this, is there an estimation about when the chapter 26 is, you know, the rewrite of that is going to occur? And along with that, uh, it, it would appear that the consolidation of the two committees, the boards, may not be implemented until that chapter is completed and approved. Correct. Um, so at this point in time, the the goal for the land development regulation update is for it to be uh, before city council for their decision uh, by uh, October. The wrinkle there is some of the uh, proposed changes are dependent upon the approval of the comprehensive plan. So the effective date of those land development regulations may be uh, closer towards the beginning of, uh, of next year uh, based on the uh, time or view time requirements for the state in terms of processing the, the uh, comprehensive plan approval process. So the anticipation, I um, guess what I'm hearing, the anticipation of the uh, cons uh, consolidated board or committee yep. will not be in effect until that time. That's a, Is that what you anticipate? Yes. Okay, and, and one more, because we've had this discussion a couple of times, section 1.3 conditions. Members who fail to attend three meetings 
and it has in a 12 month period shall automatically forfeit appointment. Are we still working on a rolling 12 month or have we gone to a calendar year? It's still the rolling 12 months. We will be bringing that up with council once we do take the planning commission um, bylaws forward. We're just, again, with the chapter 26 changes that are coming, it just like the HPAB bylaws, it's somewhat delayed. Okay. So then do you need a recommendation for us, from us then, a formal, do you need a? We just wanted some feedback for now and then we'll be returning with it. Um, thank you for voicing some of your concerns. We'll make sure those are addressed when we do bring it back as we get closer. Are there any other concerns? Someone else? Okay then. We move on our, our next item for discussion. The city attorney's response to the planning commission's questions. Page 109. The city attorney has provided a response to the planning commission's questions as followed. In section 3.1 regarding recommendations made by the commission, should the verbiage be changed to add hurricane to the list or replace the list with natural disasters as worded? I think hurricanes and natural disasters are already included in the phrase other disaster. Comments? Okay. Second question, are members required to cite which criteria they feel an application has not met when voting against a proposal? The response is that even though under most circumstances the planning commission is not the decision maker but an advisory board, since the city council relies upon recommendations of the planning commission involving quasi-judicial decisions, the planning commission should act as they were in fact the decision makers. Towards that end, speaking with respect to quasi-judicial decisions such as rezoning requests, the Florida Supreme Court in Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County versus Snyder, Florida 1993, noted in order to sustain the board's actions upon review by certiorari in the circuit court, it must be shown that there was competent substantial evidence presented to the board to support its ruling. While pointing to evidence and testimony provided during the public hearing on the matter is relatively easy to sustain a decision to approve a rezoning such is generally not the case to sustain a denial without a discussion by the board of the reasons for denial. In Debs versus City of Key West, Florida Third Circuit Court, 1997, the court found that the refusal to rezone property followed by, following the request by the property owner was arbitrary, discriminatory, and unreasonable, absent evidence, and stated the grounds to support the denial. Accordingly, to ensure that the Planning Commission and the City Council's actions in quasi-judicial matters are upheld on judicial review, reference to the relevant criteria should be discussed before any motion to approve or deny a request is voted upon. So, in essence, what he's saying is, uh, even though we're an advisory board, uh, our decisions are part and parcel to what could be the ongoing decision in court and they must be framed as though they could be supported in court. Um, and I think uh, the city attorney has on a number of occasions alluded to that pretty directly in terms of, okay, this might work here right now, but what's this gonna look like on appeal? How is this gonna stand up on appeal? And whether it's uh, an overabundance of caution or whatever, the, uh, the court decisions seem to uh, support him in that and, um, so it's um, better safe than sorry and to, to act um, you know, as though our decisions could be questioned by uh, an appeal authority and to give him the evidence, him or her, the evidence they would need you know, to take it to court. Any other comments? I thought the issue was when a minority <clears throat> member voted against the proposal that we were told that that minority member had to explain why he voted against that proposal. It was not a question of whether the board as a whole that approved or denied had to explain, but whether a minority member, a single member or two, 
who voted against a majority had to explain why they voted against the majority. I don't think this answers that question. This de deals with the boards as a whole need to explain why they denied an applicant. That's what these cases are about, not the procedure with individual members <coughs> as part of a board. That was my recollection of the discussion. Yeah, I agree. It seems to me that in the uh, question uh, that was placed in front of the city attorney, are members required to cite which criteria they feel in an application has not met when voting against a proposal? I mean, that, that, is the, that was the question. And um, I, it appears that while some of the explanation uh, or findings uh, that were stated here um, may apply to the, a board as a whole, um, the, uh, in the details, it requires that, it seems to require that, as, or as the attorney has ruled, if you will, that um, the discussion uh, should follow with the reasons for denial, the justification. I guess what I'm saying is, to me, it, it answers the question. I have one question. Are we ever a decision-making board? It no. says in most cases we are. Are we ever a decision-making board? I think what this says is, I would think that would be a moot point because it, it says it doesn't matter whether you're a decision-making board, you must act as though you are a decision-making board because on appeal, they're gonna consider what you did in terms of the decision. So, you know, they're saying, okay, you're not, but you still need to act as a decision-making board. Um, would, would they, um, on appeal, would they use the individual discussions of the board members as um, evidence of, of approval or non-approval? In other words, if, if to Paul's point, if an individual member um, decides to not recommend approval and doesn't state a specific reason, would that be used in a court? Otherwise, it's going to look like it's always going to be a unanimous decision, yeah, and exactly. you won't have any dissent at all. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but if it goes, it's only going to go forward if it's appealed. So if the board votes 3-2 or 4-3, um, I would assume all testimony, because everything's being recorded here, is a matter of public record, and everything is going to be considered. So individual comments by board members, regardless of how they vote, is going to be part of the record and is going to be part of the appeal and subject to review. And so. You know, it seems to be in play. To me, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brad. Uh, I have a, I guess I'm a little confused here. And I'm apparently not the only one. But if this board here, as now and it shall become, denies or appeals, approves something, say approves it. That does not mean that it is established as the ruling of the town, of the city. If this planning commission denies a program, be my what it may, it does not mean that the person who has made the request is denied. That person is only denied when the council says they don't approve it. Otherwise, legally, we haven't done anything, so we aren't really legally acting as the final authority. I think the key word here is final authority, final approval. 
Could I we are making, am I correct? Pipe in here real quick. The city attorney is aware that this is not a decision making board. Right. And this is what his advice is for the board. Right. And we've been on both sides of that since I've been on the board. We've made recommendations for approval and recommendations for denial. And the city council has just overturned our decision and gone on their way. That's, that's their prerogative. We so far, to the best of my knowledge, no one's taken the city council to court because of their decision. This is just saying, in these instances, the city council was taken to court and the court ruled that in their you know, consideration, the, the planning commission should be acting as an ad hoc um, decision-making board uh, and should be in their decisions considering the fact that uh, the reasoning they have for making their decisions pro or con, especially con, uh, would have to uh, stand up to scrutiny in an appeals court. In that, in that, thank you. In that, under that, in those, those circumstances, or as an, what you said as an example, if the planning commission were to deny a request, um, uh, in this case, uh, the members of the planning commission. I mean, if, if it was, well, the majority of the planning commission voted to deny the request. Okay, uh, and that was the, the, the recommendation of the planning commission. It still requires the members of the planning commission who re, re, who voted to deny the request to specifically state what the grounds were for their vote of denial. Otherwise, as it says here, um, the decision uh, overall is arbitrary, discriminatory, discriminatory, and unreasonable with an unreasonable absence of um, of, of evidence. Because we have not, the individuals stating their reason for denial have not provided the evidence that they believe the request should be denied. So I have a question on that. So with the plan development, they can, city council can override land development regulations. So as an individual, I can deny something based on my belief that the land development regulations were created by the community to support what we want this community to look like. Mm -hmm. That's reason for me to deny as far as I'm concerned. What city council does in the plan development is their choice. But I think if we say it doesn't meet the land development regulations, it's up to city council to supersede that. We don't have the authority to supersede Ooh. that. That's come up before where it's like, oh, well, the plan development can do anything. But I think it's our job to, yeah, I mean, if we feel strongly that it should meet the land development regulations, that's why they were established, we have the right to say that. Well, yeah. can I say something, please? We've had two cases recently, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which are perfect examples. In the, in the city marketplace case, the uh, board the planning commission denied the request, voted against it. It went to the... Uh, city Council and the City Council uh, <coughs> considered the matter not that I know that they ever registered <coughs> all of their criteria for why and th I don't s they, they I don't think they were going to approve it if the in the, in the event of the, the Planning Commission's uh, denial of the request but the conditions they put upon the developer caused them to withdraw his development completely and walk away. <clears throat> so then we come to Fisherman's Village. In Fisherman's Village case, the Planning Commission approved it. But the City Council didn't use the same criteria we use as far as I know. They denied it. And so where is the, where are the implementation of these rules being carried out? So in both of those cases, um, those cases were withdrawn. Yeah. So there city was no city council decision right. on either of those. Right. There, there was uh, discussion on, uh, on one, uh, 
on the city uh, city marketplace case, they actually had the public hearing uh, first of two at city council, and then it was withdrawn based on that discussion. Uh, the other one was not even heard by city council at all. Um, so, just as point of clarification there. Uh, at the end of the day, the way that the code is written right now, this board does not, is not the approval authority. But even in a case where this board was an approval authority, the code would be written as, in such a way that the right of appeal for that person, the due process for the applicant that was denied by this board would be appealed to city council. City council's decision that would, would then be ultimately final and appealable to the district court. So as far as individual board members go, you do have two layers of protection, A, city council, and B, city staff. Um, so in, in the case of, of somebody suing the city, an applicant suing the city based on our decision, uh, that those are the parties that they're primarily going to be talking to unless there's just something absolutely as in the cases noted by the city attorney egregious occurred that they pointed out specifically to the court that the planning commission is where prejudice may have started in this case so that is where that is where those legal opinions go, and that is why the city attorney is saying that when you make a decision that goes against staff's recommendation, um, that that is the point to say, you know, this is why we're making this. It's not just because our opinion. Um, it has to be based in fact because this is quasi-judicial. This is not a democratic process. It's a legal, quasi-legal process. And I'd like to add that I'm sure city council would be very interested to know why it is you want to deny an application to or to vote against one, whether everyone's voting to approve something and one person or a couple people are like, no, I'm not for this, or whether it's the majority wants to deny it and there's a couple people who want to approve it. The whole reason we have this board is so that you can make recommendations to council, and if we do have a minority dissenting, I'm sure they would love to know what the reasons for that are. I would agree with that, because the criteria that we're supposed to be using is based on evidence, evidence of testimony, and we're providing evidence of testimony in our judgment. It has to be based on the same, it has to have the same foundation. All it would have taken was the right or wrong lawyer, depending upon how you look at it, to be involved in either one of those cases, and it could have ended up being litigated. You know, and then everything would come in as part of the uh, court case. I mean, it didn't happen, but it could. And I think I've, I've heard, you know, Mr. Levin more and more. I didn't used to notice him saying these sorts of things, but he talks about on appeal on appeal, you know, and lawyers now are more and more seeming, you know, I don't just need to win this case, I have to think about winning this case on appeal because I know it's gonna get appealed. And, and uh, you know, that's sort of the process we're in. Uh, but I mean, you know, I'm sure Paul, you remember from, you know, the adventures with Mr. Sheet and company. Uh, yeah, but that was over, that's not, that's not zoning. That's not zoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know that sort of thing. Uh, it, you know, the, 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 depending on the lawyer involved, it could get real interesting in a real hurry. Um, and, luckily, and so far, at least in our experience, other than doing things like trampolines and a few other things that the city council didn't like, um, you know, we've been pretty lucky. Well, I think the, on the, the board, those, excuse me, in the board of zoning appeals, if the board of zoning appeals denies a variance, that has to be appealed to the city council, or can be appealed, can Pat, be appealed. The Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Punta Gorda is also an advisory board, and city council is the final decision maker for that as well. Yeah, but the, but it, but the form is an appeal to the city council, as I understand it, because um, the mayor resigned from the code of the Board of Zoning Appeals because the city council did not uphold 
the board's ruling on a variance, a very uh, uh, obvious variance problem. So uh, they do appeal to the city council, but I understand it's an appeal. It's not like uh, a normal review process. I mean, a variance. I think when the Board of Zoning Appeal denies a variance, it ha in order for the applicant to be successful, they have to appeal that decision to the city council. Isn't that true? So the variance process, which I have to admit I'm not super familiar with, the zoning official would be the, the better source on that because fortunately we don't have very many variances within the city of Punta Gorda, uh, at least in the last five or six years. But the variance process is twofold. There's an administrative variance, which is approved, by, approved or denied by the zoning official. That administrative variance process can then be appealed to the Board of Zoning Appeals and then ultimately to City Council. So that's a, a three-stage process potentially. If the zoning official denies it, the Board of Zoning Appeals denies it, then City Council. The other, the standard variance process, is staff makes uh, a recommendation uh, that is brought to the Board of Zoning Appeals for their recommendation, and then that goes to City Council for decision. So there, there are two different processes. One's administrative, and one is, is the standard variance process. So yes and no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> I appreciate that. Back to what City Council hears. Um, if the decision is 5 2 either way, um, if it's 5 2 to recommend approval, um, does the city council get the vote or do they just get the recommendation of the board? If they just get the recommendation of the board, they never hear that there were two dissenters. Well, what happens a lot of the time, they try to time it so that we can finish preparing the minutes to provide to city council so they can read over what happened. Mm -hmm. But occasionally there will be one where we don't have enough time to create the minutes uh, fully yet. So even when we do that, though, I know a lot of council members will actually go back and watch the public hearing yeah. because they want to know exactly what was said. They want to be as informed as they possibly can be. And just as a point of order, when I was on the city council, I used to do both. Mm -hmm. I'd read the minutes and watch the uh, public hearing. Or in some cases, if it's really controversial, I would attend a public hearing yeah. and, and make notes. Mm -hmm. And if you miss your three meetings, that's also an appeal to city council. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen it one time, but yes. Okay. Yeah. If I may. Yes, sir. Um, a lot of what we're doing right here now is also a little bit of speculation on what we aren't getting legal advice officially. Uh, I'm trying to, let me start just by qualifying this a little bit. I grew up in a legal environment. My father was an attorney all his life. My Two of my uncles, or one was a federal judge, and I lived in this environment, and I got they kind of saw themselves as the experts and cringed a little bit if groups speculated too much on what the legal ramifications of a question were without getting the, and then acting on it without getting the specifics. I think we have, from an attorney, legal advice, I think we have done pretty well, and the council has too, of getting legal advice. We have a, a, a attorney, city attorney, and so I, uh, it worries me a little bit if we say, well, this is legal and this isn't, or where's the line there where we're walking over and becoming Well, the advisors. email that was shared was from the attorney. That was his advice for members of the board. Right. Yeah, I have no problem with that. But uh, when we cite attorneys or legal advice, it, it seems like sometimes we're giving legal advice here without uh, actually 
having received it. I don't, not, you know I don't, I I don't see it that way. Okay. I think, I'm, I think, I'm not talking about the broad sense. I'm talking about speculating on whether something we might do is legal or not. I guess I'm, I, I, I'm not expressing myself well, so I apologize for that. But we are not attorneys. So we follow their advice, and there's the rules, and that's what we need to do. But I can't sit here and cite an attorney on something I really don't know about, or it's up to a legal authority to actually pass on some of the things I think we're speculating at occasionally. Do you agree? Or I, I don't think we're in any, any danger of violating law or code no. or anything like that. I think as long as we act in good faith and adhere to the instructions that staff gives us, and you know, if it's got five criteria and it meets five criteria, yay verily. I think where we can stray is if for whatever personal reason we go, no, I don't think I have to believe that. I think it's such and 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 you know diverge from from that. Uh, now, I don't think anybody's going to like willingly, willfully do something like that, but I think as long, and that's just what the attorney is telling us here, you know, as long as we just sort of consider what we're doing um, and, and look at the, the long-term ramifications of it, um, you know, we're in good shape. Uh, it's, it's if we sort of start, you know, interjecting our opinion of what's legal vice what what sort of gu guidance we've gotten. And I don't think we've done that sort of thing. Yeah, I was beginning to think that maybe we were starting to do that, which I guess no. is kind of what my yeah. Yeah, I, no, I, We don't want to get near that at all. You know, we're, I not, totally, we're not lawyers. Uh, that's what I'm saying. The we're one not lawyer lawyers. we have and he's not here. But <laughs> so we, we're saying the same thing differently. Yeah. Or I yeah. misunderstood yeah. because I was beginning to think we were sounding like lawyers. No. To me, anyway. That we, asked, we asked for advice and guidance and, and uh, a ruling, if you will, uh, from the city attorney on a couple of matters, and he's provided it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And whenever we get near touchy subjects, we ask for the attorney to be here, and he's usually here. You know, because we're not. Okay, so the last question. Are petitions from citizens qualified as evidence or considered hearsay per the city's adopted quasi-judicial procedure? Citizen petitions are considered as hearsay evidence and should not be the basis of any decision in a quasi-judicial matter, nor shall mere citizen testimony stating opposition or support for a quasi-judicial matter. Decisions must be based on competent, substantial evidence in the record before the decision maker. Questions, comments? Yeah. And that has always been the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last one, on to the always stimulating Comprehensive Plan 2045 discussion. You guys oh, got duties and responsibilities where you need to speak into the microphone. Yeah. I'm Brittany, I'm the Planner One with Urban Design, and I'm going to be presenting the proposed mm -hmm. plan amendment. <laughs> Okay. So since I began with the city last November, I've been working almost exclusively on updating the comprehensive plan. I started by reading every recent city publication, attended meetings and watched them online, and I've contacted anyone who has knowledge or insight regarding what's written in the plan. I've called people that work in the city and elsewhere, toured facilities, and finally had enough background to start updating the elements one by one. Now that all my notes have been compiled, I'm able to review and make amendments to elements, have the department assess and add to my work, and publish the final review and installments. We are releasing the revised elements now to give everyone as much time as possible to provide us with feedback before they are due to the state in November. Throughout this process, up until City Council recommends transmitting these amendments to the state, urban design staff will re receive and review comments from the public and boarding committee members about the proposed updates. 
So the proposed evaluation and appraisal report amendments must assess the success or failure of the adopted Comprehensive Plan 2040, including the validity of projections, the realization of goals and objectives, and the implementation of the plan's policies. It must also address changes in the local conditions, the effect of the Comprehensive Plan, of the effect on the Comprehensive Plan of changes to the State Comprehensive Plan and the local and the regional policy plan. It must suggest changes needed to update the Comprehensive Plan and reformulate goals, objectives, policies, maps, schedules, and procedures to effectively address new priorities. There are two types of amendments. Qualitative or normative amendments are driven by the community's vision and best management practices and used to determine the kind of change we want to see and how we ought to go about it. They are used to define what success or failure in achieving our goals looks like and evaluate our progress based on what we have judged as a community to be important. Other amendments are quantitative. They are based on data and analysis. These types of amendments were made by replacing old data with recent facts and figures from reliable sources. For example, data was taken from the U.S. Census, the Bureau of Economic and Business Research, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership, and professional consultants. Out-of-date policies were deleted and projections, maps, and appendices were updated. So qualitative amendments fall into three general categories. There have been a few federal, state, regional, and county regulatory updates. New legislation has been adopted and old legislation has been repealed. Many amendments have been made to incorporate new directives, specifically concerning water quality issues and resilience strategies. The city has undertaken major planning and visioning studies through the Charette and public input processes that led up to the 2019 <coughs> citywide master plan. A firm community vision was established for Punta Gorda. Other planning studies that happened around this time helped formulate new goals, objectives, and policies that fit and gave impetus to Punta Gorda's vision. City discussions during public meetings, internal reports, and stakeholder input help to make recommendations in finer detail. They give boots on the ground insight to what actually works and is needed on a day-to-day -day basis and establish realistic expectations for policies and programs. Today, I will be introducing three of the 13 elements infrastructure, community facilities and services, and conservation, and explaining the reasoning behind the proposed amendments. The purpose of the infrastructure element is to guide the provision of water and sewer, solid waste, and stormwater infrastructure to ensure these services are available to the community as it expands. Infrastructure provision is also a way of guiding development, namely to ex expanding in ways that promote a compact and contiguous development pattern. The adopted comprehensive plan outlined and supported these concepts well. However, the inventory of potable water sources had to be updated with reports from Corolo engineers and Florida Administrative Code Rules 21 through 25 regarding infrastructure were revoked. The major changes that occurred since the last comprehensive plan update are Senate Bill 712, the Clean Waterways Act, and Executive Order 2306. The new state legislation focuses on nutrient load reduction for surface groundwaters. Through these initiatives and the wastewater grant program, the state has increased funding for advanced wastewater treatment upgrades, septic to sewer conversions, stormwater management, water quality monitoring, and resilience projects. The Clean Waterways Act has also strengthened regulatory requirements that are enforced and monitored by the regional permitting bodies. Punta Gorda has entered into a wastewater mutual aid program with other local governments in Florida, which successfully helped us obtain emergency assistance after Hurricane Ian. The utilities after action report, the city's climate adaptation plan, and the 2018 vulnerabilities assessment were used to identify the areas of infrastructure that are most susceptible to incurring storm damage and the most efficient ways to restore them. This information was used to update the goals, objectives, and policies by deleting policies that no longer apply and adding policies that support new state directives, regional permitting authority requirements, and best management practices. The community facilities and services element identifies and describes the locations and arrangements of the city's facilities and services provided. In the previous comprehensive plan, services were loosely explained and supported. In the proposed amendments, em emphasis was given to them because of the role they play in emergency management and response. Particular emphasis was given to communications infrastructure. Significant federal funding has been allocated for infrastructure hardening under Public Law 117.58 a.k.a. the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 
Additionally, FEMA's update to the floodplain maps will influence the siting of future community facilities. Considerable updates to the facilities and services inventory were made to address the city's response to population growth and the actions that have been taken to centralize development in the downtown area. The proposed conservation element amendments address the changes made across all levels of government concerning water quality, hydrologic restoration, and conservation. The previous comprehensive plan did not adequately explain how these can be applied as resilient strategies. Information was also added to bring the element up to date with the latest studies and regulations. Senate Bill 712, the Clean Waterways Act, prioritizes reducing nutrient pollution and increasing water quality monitoring in an effort to reduce harmful algal blooms and seagrass loss. Executive Order 2306 grants added funding to the programs outlined in the Clean Waterways Act and expands it to include addressing the impacts of stormwater runoff, provided, providing expedited hurricane relief, and supporting the completion of comprehensive vulnerability assessments for Florida's municipalities. The most recent CHNEP Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan and Swift Mud Surface Water Improvement Management Program seek to address the issues of blue-green algae, red tide algal blooms, and seagrass loss. They both stress the importance of reducing nutrient loading to surface water by managing agricultural and stormwater runoff. To achieve this, many of the state's conservation programs have been retargeted towards hydrologic, re hydrologic restoration and land acquisition as a means of improving water quality. Swift Mud, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and other stakeholder groups have begun projects in the Charlotte Harbor watershed adjacent to Punta Gorda to fill in finger dredges and restore the pine flatwoods. These projects have the added benefit of providing flood protection by preserving natural drainage patterns. FEMA also recognizes that nature-based components and conservation strategies reduce flood risks. Their community rating system program details how linking habitat protection and restoration mitigates flood risks. These resilient strategies were included in the city's climate adaptation plan, along with natural shoreline retention and oyster reef cultivation. Climate change adaptation, emergency preparedness, and emissions reduction are methods of hardening facilities and making the community more resilient. They fall under the strategic plan priority of financial economic sustainability. There are ample opportunities through the federal and state government to pursue grant funding for programs that reduce carbon emissions, improve water quality, harden infrastructure, and expand communications. Through partnerships and collaboration, the city is well positioned to take advantage of these programs and continue to build the community we've all envisioned, one that has an outstanding quality of life enhanced by our proximity to the harbor and not destroyed by it where we can enjoy the beautiful ecology of Southwest Florida without continually rebuilding our subtropical city. The updated comprehensive plan needs to reflect this vision and firmly identify policies that can be successfully implemented and achieved. Questions about any of the three I've gone over? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, I paid a lot of attention to the conservation element and uh, as a result, uh, I went online to do a little research on the, what's going on with the Chesapeake Bay. Now, the Chesapeake Bay is a 250-mile-long estuary and body of water that has a number of rivers that run into it. And uh, I know a little about it because I sailed on the Chesapeake Bay for almost 20 years. One of the things that was interesting to me that isn't mentioned is that they have determined that 20 to 30 percent of the nitrogen load in the water of the Chesapeake Bay is coming from airborne nitrogen, not from agricultural runoff or stormwater. It's coming from the exhaust of transportation, okay? And uh, we have, the Chesapeake Bay only has one major bridge uh, on Route 50 that crosses the bay and another way down toward the Atlantic Ocean uh, doing, toward Cape Charles. Um, we have two major bridges that go over a relatively small harbor. Those bridges carry a lot of traffic, especially 75. During the rainy season, if in fact a substantial amount of nitrogen is coming from airborne transportation, the rainy season is capturing that nitrogen and dumping it right into our harbor. I think we need to think outside the box on this one 
because we, uh, I think a large substantial amount of the nitrogen which causes green algae, which is killing the seagrass, is, is airborne nitrogen coming from transportation because of the heavy traffic on our two bridges, which is over a relatively small body of water. So uh, I don't see that mentioned anywhere in the conservation element uh, to discuss that. I think it's something that should be looked at uh, by staff and by your consultants. Um, I don't know what you can do about it, but the sooner we get to electric vehicles, the better off we're gonna be with regard to that airborne load that's coming down, that nitrogen load that's coming from transportation. So yeah, two things. So I think that's an appropriate thing to discuss in the transportation element and also Possibly infrastructure, we could add it because there's ways of sequestering all of the storm water and processing it before it gets dumped into the harbor. And also, I think Chesapeake Bay is a pilot program for the natural shoreline retention and oyster reef projects yep. that they're wa working on. Yep. So I think mm -hmm. um, we already do have things in our comprehensive plan that kind of touch on it, but we could do more to expand on what you're talking yeah, about. Well I, well, I noticed that you said you were looking at agricultural runoff and stormwater runoff. Yeah. There's no mention of airborne pollution, mm -hmm. airborne nitrogen, and I think it needs to be addressed. Now, I don't know what you can do about it mm -hmm. currently, but I think it's an issue where you have to understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, for the record, Mitchell Austin, Urban Design. So one of the primary differences in terms of, uh, of the Chesapeake Bay area and Florida in general and, and Punta Gorda in specific is that uh, the Washington DC and Baltimore metro areas are non-attainment areas for air quality. Uh, so there's a whole different level of scrutiny on those and funding resources for addressing those concerns through the, through, through the federal um, various federal programs. Uh, the entire state of Florida is, uh, is, is okay as far as air quality from the EPA standards uh, for, for non-attainment uh, of, of air quality. So there are less resources devoted to even studying those potential impacts. So that's one of the things that the comprehensive plan relies on is we are not necessarily generating the lion's share of this data that you read in this document. We're pulling it from other resources. The data simply doesn't exist, so we can't address it directly. Yeah. And certainly from the standpoint of being a small municipality, we, we don't have the resources to devote to, to studying that level of impact. But we can certainly draw on that as another potential source and tie, uh, you know, transportation improvements, the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, generally those would have positive impacts. So those are all uh, things that may be reinforced by that, um, those existing studies from other locations. So yes, we, we definitely will, will take a look at that and see if there are ways to fold it in, but addressing it directly is something that, that we probably, is beyond our capacity to do. Yeah, see, I, uh, I, I was thinking that uh, I'd go out in the drought season and measure the level of oxygen, uh, nitrogen under the bridges and alongside the bridges, okay, a quarter of a mile each way, and then during a real good rainstorm, I'd go out there and check the nitrogen level in the water uh, to see whether it's changed, and if it's changed significantly. Not a very elaborate mm. set of tests, but they would be telling, I think, if we did something like that, and I don't think it would be very expensive. Uh, the only thing I see here is that it's specifically the bridges and the nitrogen levels there have to take into consideration the tides and the flushing of our community, mm -hmm. which is unusual in that we have 110 miles of flushed canals behind all our houses. Mm -hmm. So, and also mm -hmm. uh, Florida, 
of other than pollen uh, and, and those with allergies enjoy some of the best precious air because we get sea breezes and land breezes every day coming off of the Gulf of uh, Gulf or the ocean. Uh, and I understand what you're saying. However, I think we are probably a bit more fortunate than most in also Chesapeake Bay, which isn't a peninsula. So they don't get the benefit of the water flooding and, and uh, uh, sea breezes. Plus, we're not a real wide state. I've just been over it twice in the uh, last few days, and it takes three hours to get across the state by the back roads at 50 miles an hour. So it's not too bad. To your point of the canals, um, my biggest thing was in the goals and objectives you know, coming from industry, uh, you have to have measurable, achievable, specific, countable, you know, none of, when you read the goals and objectives, they're very vague, they're extremely vague, there's no actual measures. I think, you know, the update of the plan is predominantly based on changes in either organizations and what they're doing or government regulations but when we get to the um, specific goals and objectives, ours are very weak, I think, from my perspective. For example, um, in the conservation area, it says reducing nonpoint uh, pollutant runoff. So nonpoint pollutant runoff is pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. So we have control over that. We have some, we do, we do. That we're, um, the Food, Agriculture, and Conservation Trade Act of 1990 contains regulations that require certified applicators of restricted use pesticides to keep records of applications. We could require, we could have a permitting system, we could require the people that are applying pesticides and herbicides in our community and fertilizers to give us records. We don't, we don't draw any correlation. I walk, to, every day when I walk my dogs, there's another sign, you know, problem solved, you know, not problem solved. Herbicides and pesticides are like homicide and suicide. They're killers. They're mostly carcinogens. In this report, it talks about earlier some of the chemicals that they found in one of the tributary creeks, and I looked up every one of the chemicals. Lindane. Uh, Agriculture ended use in 2007. Dieldrin, banned in 1974. Benzyl chloride, carcinogen, carcinogen and mutagen. All these things, it's the same thing. Maybe they haven't come up yet, but it's all the same thing. We do have control over that. We could, I know that we have, uh, you know, during rainy season, they're not supposed to apply as much, and, but they do. They do, and if you look on any herbicide or pesticide, especially, it says do not apply within 100 feet of a water source. And if you're on a canal and somebody's putting stuff in your backyard, they are violating that law. So I think some of the, we, we have control and we should be using that control to improve. I mean, we have a unique, we have a unique environment here. And, you know, people are like, Oh, the sugar industry and this and that. It's right here in our own backyards that we can control it, and we're not. I went, I, looked up, I went and I looked up for you some more examples of model legislation with regards to Florida-friendly landscaping and reducing pesticides and herbicides. And I found this. It's three model ordinances from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the University of Florida, and 1,000 Friends of Florida. And so, yeah, you're right. Right now, the only thing the city does is we don't allow fertilizing or putting we stuff on the We say we don't allow, but we have no and way to we regulate don't, that. Right, we don't have a way to really enforce it either. And, um, but there's just a couple other things we could do, but other than that, we can't be too restrictive. More restrictive than we are, we don't have a lot of options. Why not? Well, I don't know. I have to study it yeah, further, but yeah, I just okay. know that with this, yeah. there was only three ordinances that, you know, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection would think of. And we already have one of them. 
so, so without getting too overtly political, um, yes, you're absolutely correct. And in the years I've lived here, I've heard this discussion year after year and why come every June and the approaching of rainy season, people aren't supposed to fertilize and the landscapers just keep fertilizing because again, there is no actual enforcement. However, and I, I didn't follow this bill quite as closely in the last legislature as some of the others, but uh, it was one of the thing, provisions that was either added, subtracted right out at the end and essentially negated all of the enforcement for the uh, no fertilizer and just kind of wiped out everything. It either wiped out or it reinstated uh, the ability to fertilize after the bill had gone through and said exactly the opposite. There is simply not the political will in a state level here to enforce a lot of this. There are some fertilizers they can apply legally and that yep. is iron. Right. They can, they can fertilize with iron, but they cannot put anything with phosphorus or nitrogen. Yeah. Any fertilizers with nitrogen or phosphorus, but they can put iron because my guy puts iron. Yeah. But we don't know what they put. We yeah. don't have any record. We don't have any documentation. Well, we don't, we have, a, we have a, a rule that says you can't do it. We don't have any enforcement. We have no knowledge. And, and, and in my house before I, I had, um, I had one guy who was doing my lawn. Unfortunately, problem solved was, turned out to be a great problem because they kept showing up and fertilizing my lawn a second time every month. And I kept calling them saying, no, stop fertilizing my lawn, you're killing it. And they would fertilize it and my guy would fertilize it and they would, and it just, <laughs> stop. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty near. To my point. It damn near killed yeah. my entire lawn <laughs> wow. from being over fertilized. Yeah. I, had, I ended up having to soak it with water you know, water it five or six days a week to dilute the uh, fertilizer. We just tested Yeah, so anyway, if, but yes, you're yeah, absolutely I mean, right. If you look at, if you read the goals and objectives, I, I challenge you to go home and read just the goals and objectives and say whether or not you think, like one of them is, you know, um, measurement. Number of identified inefficiencies and number of capital improvements completed. I can spend money on capital improvements all day long, but if it doesn't actually solve the problem, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's not a measure of improvement. That's just a measure of activity. So I think we have a lot of things in here that don't measure that. Um, to your point about Naples is getting some hybrid buses so and, and uh, electric buses. So other communities are doing things. In 2005, Sarasota County uh, enacted green building. So uh, in the United States, buildings account for 70% of total electricity and almost 40% of carbon dioxide emissions, 12% of total water used. As an example, LEED certified buildings have 34% lower CO2 emissions, 25% less energy, 11% less <coughs> water. So. They have, they've already, since 2005, they have implemented this and they have lead, three lead gold buildings that they've built. Uh, I don't know, have 10 lead silver, other lead certified and some other green globes. So they've done quite a bit. And all of these programs, well, the whole idea behind green programs is to, it, it forces individuals rather than the city to conserve water, conserve electricity, cons you know, pr protect us from, you know, dumping storm water. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are built in. So if we would encourage green building, and right now I think we're in a perfect spot. We're gonna get developed. We're the last frontier here. <laughs> we're gonna get developed. And how we develop is up to us. And we can let it run rampant or we can start implementing some of these policies that make our community outstanding. And with our estuary here, I think if we don't, <laughs> we're gonna be screwed. I mean, we don't have, we're looking at what we can do for freshwater sources. So conservation is really a key on all of those areas. So I just think, you know, we have we, have, we can do something and we can't just say, oh, well, you know, yeah. But if you look at the goals and objectives, they're very vague. They're not based on actual improvement. We should have, Brittany and I spoke and 
I liked your idea, have your goals and objectives separate from your comprehensive plan. So you have a, like a uh, report card every year. How did we do? Did we improve in these areas? Just because we did a lot of activities, so what? Did we improve? Red, green, and I think, you know, it would be to our benefit to really take a look at the goals and objectives and make them meaningful. So that's my point. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Don't misunderstand what I said that we are fortunate in where we are means no, no. we don't no, protect I, what we have. Yeah. Um, and we are fortunate. Anyone that's lived in uh, a major metropolitan area for very long and is through a cold winter with lots of exhaust that doesn't go anywhere and so on, we, we are fortunate. Things we aren't addressing, which we should, are uh, above ground septic tanks and fields. And we have literally from here within, I would say, a three mile radius, maybe no, three mile radius, we have literally hundreds, if not thousands, right. of and above ground. If you look at the if you look at the goal and the, how we measure that, it's how many new building new buildings mm -hmm. were built that have city water and sewer, not how many were built that don't have sewer. Right. Because yeah. that's the that's the impact. Finding out that oh yeah okay we're and one of the, these said oh we're going to control a way to control air emissions is we're going to control. Um, and compact, have compact building areas. We're not gonna do that. I mean, we're not doing that. You know, we have 144 lots in a 25 acre plot, but I mean, in that <laughs> sense we are, but we can't control that. People buy land, they develop it. But we can control public transportation, electric buses, things like that. People go back and forth you know, just to downtown in the evenings for dinner, you know, there's all kinds of traffic. Mm -hmm. Or later when we have this thing over the bridge, we have all kinds of opportunity <laughs> to do some things that can improve those areas that are proactive. No argument. So as a subset of this comprehensive plan, there are other documents. Oops, I'm trying. So as a subset of this comprehensive plan, there are other documents that attempt to do more of what you're talking about, attempt to uh, bring it to a more granular level, attempt to apply more measurable metrics and that side of thing. And so we could look for incorporating you know, more measurable metric type activity in a shorter range plan as opposed to 2045 where I'm not going to be here. Yeah. Uh, but I mean even the goals and objectives yeah. that are yeah. in here. Why have them in here if they're meaningless? I mean, I mean you know, it's like why I have it's... things in here that, don't, that actually don't measure what we're trying to improve? Just measuring activity doesn't doesn't improve anything. Because it's such a long range plan, it's meant to be apolitical because you don't know what the governing body 10 years from now, 20 years from now is gonna want, so you wanna provide a degree of maneuverability for them so they could truly represent however the community feels at that point. Uh, to that extent, uh, I have reviewed chapter eight on public schools about, because that's come out I would suggest you have some discussion on the impact of charter schools on public school uh, attendance, public school planning, because the governor has just passed a new piece of legislation that's going to expand the ability of anybody to use charter schools. Charter schools makes it very difficult to do public school planning because they have a fairly sizable failure rate. And when they fail, the, the load goes back onto the public schools in the assumption that the public school has planned that the charter school is going to take up some of these pupils. Okay. So yeah. I think you need to include some discussion in the public school facilities section that has to do with the impact of charter school expansion on the planning for public school availability. Okay. Well, that's on the docket for the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah. Without without digging too deep into politics, yeah. some of this is 
And if you make claims about charter schools versus public schools, you need to have the documentation yeah. to substantiate that, yeah. <laughs> not just an opinion. Yeah. And, 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 well, I think you just did. But, but, And, but there's no discussion yeah. on the interface of the interaction between charter schools and public schools with regard to planning for pupil load. For example, okay. if this community development uh, outfit decides to install a charter school in the middle of their development, all of the pupil loads that we've calculated may or may not disappear. But again, some of this is a, yeah, this is a very, broad brush strategic document. You can talk about it in a theoretical sense, but again, if you look at what's the responsibility of the city, the county, private development, you know, some of this is, is you know, we can talk about it in a, a broad sense, but uh, there's very little you can do other than speculate at this time, because again, it could all change. But again, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be more than just, you know, the impact of, of, of charter schools as well. So, but that will be a discussion for our next meeting. Okay. Does that conclude your questions? <laughs> Very good. The questioning. Okay, so yeah, next meeting we're going over public school facilities, intergovernmental coordination, capital improvements, and property rights. That's all. Yeah, there's a lot of them because not too much was done with these ones. Mostly what changes the, oh, the appendix. Yeah. So will the draft elements for those uh, those four be available, made available yeah. prior to the meeting? Yeah, um, we can send them to you directly. They're also on the city's website with the exception of property rights, I think. Yeah, we got capital, we've already got capital improvements in the, in the government coordination. Right? Yeah. Hopefully they do. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yep, thank you. Excuse me, Ms. Joy. I don't know. Doing good work. Staff comments? No, staff doesn't have any additional comments. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Commission, Harvey. Thank you. It was a good discussion today. I think, um, I want to think, I, it's my opinion that I'd like to ask city staff, probably Mitchell, uh, not at this time, but sometime in the near future, to draw the distinction uh, of the relationship between plan development and land development regulations. I think there's some misconceptions about the impact of one on the other. Okay. And um, that's something you could do. Yes, we can certainly that, explore that, that be in a future with the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Tim, first meeting, comments? First meeting, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, obviously we kind of up to speed. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, like to dig into this a little bit more. Um, obviously I come from industry, come from government myself trying to get the interconnections between the city, the county, the state, and then at the federal level, because that's really where I came from, is at the federal level of what are the what are the flow downs, what are the opportunities that we can incorporate. Excellent. Good meeting, informative, and uh, good start. Sure. I'd just like to thank staff for all the work that they do. Thank you. Paul? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, my meeting with Brittany, she's done a lot of background work, so very nice. Okay, 
Well, thank you again for your work, your support. Hopefully we didn't get too esoteric in the discussions, and, and uh, I understand there'll probably be a little bit more of this. Look forward to seeing more, and um, uh, we will endeavor to keep this nonpartisan. <laughs> Anything else? Meeting's adjourned.